Okay, um, but the intent is that um, each of the eight research centers can work collaboratively together because faculties work for a department, but faculty and students can work across um, each of these different centers. Um, this, the center was established actually back in 2000. Um, and this was the original um, mission uh, associated with this particular center, which was really to conduct environmental remediation and assessment research for um, all three universities in the Montana system. And it was intended to provide a collaborative platform for each of the universities to work together, enhance that technology transfer, and to further develop some educational practices associated with it. The initial research focused predominantly around metals contamination in water. Um, some later on went to air as well. This was um, initially funded underneath an EPA EPSCOR grant, uh, but some supplemental funding was also provided by the state of Montana and US Department of Energy. A lot of it um, to do with microbial type of work activity. So when um, over Christmas, when Angela, Dan and Kumar and I had a conversation about is there an opportunity to reimagine Sarah while still maintaining an environmental focus? Um, but to think about where have we come over these last um, several decades and thinking about the incredible area that we already sit in as far as Montana Tech, we've got the history of mining and Montana Tech um, commingled over the last hundred plus years. Um, we are located within the largest Superfund site so there is um, inherently a lot of things going on from a remediation and restoration perspective. And the expertise of the faculty and the students is incredible. So is there a way to really um, bridge all of those and to further enhance and think about this particular project? And you might think about why me? Um, Angela gave you a brief introduction, but I thought I would just do a little bit more um, I know some of you quite well, but some of the other um, individuals on, on the Zoom, I don't. And so I just wanted to uh, reiterate and go a little deeper around certain elements. I graduated here with a bachelor's and master's, and I'll talk about that in a moment, associated with Montana Tech. When I graduated, I went into the pulp and paper industry. I was an environmental engineer, I was a process engineer, and I was a boiler foreman in Montana and in Oregon. So I stepped straight into how to process these work and how um, to conduct improvements, not only from an operational standpoint, but also an environmental standpoint. The first paper mill I worked at was the one that's now um, undergoing decommissioning in Missoula. And uh, the next one was out in Al Albany, Oregon. I then came back to Montana and um, after receipt of my master's was hired by Atlantic Richfield. Um, they had uh, recently acquired the Anaconda uh, company. And so there was, um, there was some still operating, but there was a lot of the mining assets that were undergoing decommissioning. Superfund had just come into being a law and was trying to figure out how to go through some of these activities. So I worked in the mining sector in Montana, Nevada, California, Utah, New Mexico, um, trying to figure out the best ways to either uh, keep mines operating or to once they had decided to go through decommissioning to go through the decommissioning of those assets. When BP acquired the Anaconda Company, I then um, moved up to Alaska because one of the things that we were looking at because of the reduction in um, oil flow through the Trans-Alaska Pipeline was we needed to decommission part of the Trans-Alaska Pipeline to allow for lower flows of oil through that location. Um, I also then became uh, BP's global decommissioning manager. So if we were taking down um, pipelines in Azerbaijan or um, tank farms in Scotland, mine sites in the US or Canada, 
for our oil and gas areas. Um, we had teams of people that would be working on those activities. Then I was called upon in 2010. Um, most folks on the call probably recall Deepwater Horizon. I got a call within 24 hours of um, the first um, release of materials. At that time, the um, platform had not sunk. It had not undergone explosion yet. And so um, my response was, you know, I, I really think people down in Texas and in the Gulf of Mexico have this handled. If you need anything in the future, let me know. Five days later, I got my second call and they said, would you come down? And so I was in charge of the natural resource damage assessment for the Gulf of Mexico and that release. And so we did all the scientific studies as well as coming up with the restoration plan. So first coming up with what were the damages um, associated with the spill, both while it was going on and afterwards, but then also how do you restore um, our largest um, oil release in the US history. And then went to work for Talisman Energy after that. As Angela mentioned, I had 30 years in and I had always had long-term plans and it was to go back and get my PhD, which was in University of Alaska Fairbanks. And I've spent the last seven years in academia where the last six years were with Colorado School of Mines, where I had a joint appointment in the engineering design and society division and the mining division. So I wanted to um, also accentuate why this particular research and, and why I got interested in uh, something like this center. And the first one goes back to how I conducted my master's work um, here at TAC. Um, I actually did uh, solidification and stabilization of the Anaconda flue dust in Anaconda, Montana. Um, you can see the smelter stack um, on the right hand side and the flue uh, going up to the stack. That um, master's work was actually uh, then selected by EPA as the remedy for that operable unit in Superfund. So I was able to take what I did as a graduate student and become the project manager for this $100 million project, um, which is a really cool thing. So I love the idea of being able to take your research, have that interaction with whether it's industry, NGO, government, whoever it might be, and then actually do something with it and act upon it. When I went back for my PhD, and I mentioned this as learning from my past, after spending two and a half years in the Gulf of Mexico on Deepwater Horizon. I was inherently living in Alaska at the time. And I thought about when I go back for my PhD, I want to think about how would I ever manage an oil spill response in the Arctic? Because it's very different conditions. You could never, we had 48,000 people at the height of Deepwater Horizon. Um, you would never be able to do something like that in the Arctic. The logistical considerations of just trying to deal with ice in the winter um, in the conditions that we have. So we came up with a method to utilize drones and helicopters because we wanted to keep people as safe as possible, but also get to them as quickly as possible. So my PhD was around the use of herders with in-situ burns. And in 2019, it became part of the updated ASTM standard on how to deal with oil spill response in the Arctic. So again, trying to learn from the past, take your research and try to have that impact upon what you're actually, you know, what the, the goals of the US industry and the planet are looking forward. So I'm, I'm very much into conducting um, really cool research. And if it's not working out, pivot um, to make something, do some improvements but really then try to figure out how you can operationalize them. So when we looked at updating the SARA mission and vision, part of it was to take a look at where we've been for the last 40 years and figure out what we want to do in the future. Uh, we still need to have a clear understanding of nature and extent of impacts. We clearly want to collaborate um, but we really want to move into that um, 
develop, validate to remedy those impacts? What can we actually do associated with them? And because it's, we have been in this um, evolution over the last several decades, it's utilizing all that information from the last 40, 50 years and saying, what would we do now in the future? And we know that we've got a lot of remediation and restoration going on, but we also know we need to make them climate resilient. We want things to be permanent and sustainable. We want waste to be reused, whether it's around um, new beneficial byproducts and, and or remedying them in a different capacity, having different land uses. Um, there's many different opportunities around beneficial reuse, but inherently we want people to be safe and we want to have that increased community value. So these were some of the program objectives that we did initially. And I'm saying all of these as, and I know I've talked to some of you all who are on the Zoom, but what can we do collaboratively to really make the best of this potential center or this center moving forward? And how can we work together to, to accomplish these goals? So the first thing I actually did, I went back and I watched some of the last five years of public lectures because I wanted to see what kind of research people were already doing here at Tech, because I hadn't heard much about it. You know, granted I was at Colorado School of Mines, so I was pretty inundated with what was going on there. But there were some amazing things that faculty and um, undergrads and graduate students have been involved in, but I never heard about it very much. I didn't hear about it much. And so there is such um, incredible expertise that just trying to leverage what already exists and figure out how to make it more known um, and make it bigger. Um, again, the collaboration between these existing research centers and Highlands and CFWEP, because we'd like to ensure that whatever we do uh, runs that full gamut of K through 12 through graduate school, because it's important to have those linkages uh, between each of these different programs when we're talking about workforce development. Continue to be that, uh, or look forward in that integrated repository of information so that people can actually look to Montana Tech in the center as a location similar to what they already do for Bureau of Mines and for camp around materials. Um, we think that it should also be around environmental issues because there are so many things that have been done over these past years and so many things yet to be done that it needs to be known and, and understood widely. Certainly growing the scale and use of the research, um, making things more operationalized in, in certain aspects um, is one of, the, are one of the goals. We want to ensure we've got that resiliency part. There are so many people that are looking at the potential effects associated with climate change, but we're not necessarily looking at it through the lens of our remedial practices. And so we wanna make sure that we're, we're doing what's needed over the long term. Continuing to expand and strengthen our partnerships with government, academia, uh, partners that I know are, um, I know Steve Thompson is on um, the Zoom call with NCAT. So just being able to bring in these additional partners to really leverage that expertise and to grow the relevancy of the program. And then these are the four R's, uh, remediation, restoration, reuse, and renewables, that there's a lot of opportunity around um, all of those sectors. And we can throw research in there too and get five R's. So we get a plus. And then certainly this is all about faculty and undergrads and graduate students being able to collectively work together and create impactful research. So we started thinking about what should some of these focus areas be and the focus areas were somewhat generated out of what had already been going on, but also what we've heard from some of the faculty and having individual conversations. And I'll go through each of these um, on individual pages. I'll put them up here quickly, but remediation and restoration, extraction and waste reuse, climate adaptation, technology development, and then always the workforce. So the first thing I, I want to mention is the extraction waste management. How can we more beneficially conduct our decommissioning 
and our reuse of these waste materials, um, whether it has to do with slag, and, and thank you, Courtney, for, for working with the senior design team on, on the slag, but you've been conducting work on it for, for many, many years. The Berkeley pit, is it a, a new venture for um, whether it's rare earth or critical minerals or something else? Um, quite a few years ago, it was around, um, cures around cancer. So can we explore these different aspects associated with these waste areas? Um, the challenge to brick, this was actually one, um, Courtney, I was listening back on your talk that you did a few years ago, and you mentioned tailings to bricks and your trip to Peru. Um, this was a, a trip that I had to Colombia, where they were doing a similar thing in the sense of converting their tailings to bricks. Um, as you can see in this picture, while they were making them and they were standing up, they did not have the structural integrity nor the um, compression that was needed to really have a successful um, brick, but they were still using them because they had limited um, options as far as how to conduct this work. So how can we make it better for not only the folks that are small artisanal miners that are utilizing this practice already, but can we grow this scale associated with some of these practices into the US and other locations? The last one on the bottom right is around biochar. We know that we have, and we've seen a lot of wildfire um, situations um, here in Montana, as well as other locations. Um, and we know that this is a potential remedy associated with it that can actually help us not only with our carbon footprint, but also with restoring some of our soils that we have. Um, so I think there's a biochar brown bay coming up. Next, when is that one coming? That's, that's, um, it's the second Wednesday in April. This is, it'll be April 13th. So on April 13th, there'll be a session on it. And I know that NCAT is also having um, a workshop series on biochar towards the end of this month. So there's a lot of activity around that. Um, uh, previously, in, uh, the environmental engineers uh, design teams have, have won at, um, I think it was last year or two years ago, was around biochar and uh, won a design competition around it as well. But again, how can we take these at the small scale and grow them into a larger scale and actually do some testing and hopefully validation and move it forward into production. The next one is around remedy and restoration. I have some pictures from the field. Um, I was the Milltown project manager um, in this lower left hand, the two bottom uh, pictures when I was with Atlantic Richfield. That was probably um, certainly the, the most complex one we had from a number of federal agencies in one location um, sort of situation because we had um, Department of Justice, DEQ, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Montana Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, Department of Transportation, Montana Rail Link, Northwestern Energy, Atlantic Richfield, and there's probably a few I'm forgetting. But there was a lot of people that came together with the, the understanding and thought that if we were going to do something along this massive scale, and it's the same on Silverboat Creek and Clark Fork. Everybody agreed that you should only turn a, a, a shovel of dirt once, that you should figure out how to do your best job possible for both remedy and restoration and try to reduce the impact on the communities and everyone else, the aquatic receptors, and only conduct this work once. But what that does take is a lot of collaboration and coordination, and it also takes everybody agreeing on what those final outcomes might look like. So trying to figure out how we can manage that also in this climate resilient area. Um, these are some of the areas, and I, I saw Todd Hoffman and, and um, is on the phone, where looking at what can you do with um, carbon dioxide. And one of the potential options, which I think was the brown bag today, was to look at can you utilize, and people are already doing some uh, deep hole injection to balance your reservoir, but can you also do it to also assist in the plug-in abandonment associated with some of these wells? Can you also look at CO2 as part of a tailings paste backfill? 
um, associated with mine sites. I know this is one of the things that Chris Roos in the mining department is considering and, and thinking about. We know that we've got um, a project going on with algae and can you take the flue gases off of natural gas facilities and make biodiesel or convert them into um, the algae. And that project is actually going pretty well as well. And then you have the, the wildfires. Is there some way that we can, again, either through biochar or we've learned a huge amount around respirators and other things, but can we actually take that and put that into our building systems? Can we have living walls that actually deal with and address some of the smoke inhalation and carbon dioxide from an indoor air pollutant perspective? So lots of opportunities around that potential. Around technologies, renewable energy and how they might align up with um, some of these legacy or stranded assets that companies might have or communities might have, where you're looking at either solar, wind, geothermal, or otherwise. We actually have all three of these in Butte. Um, it's just a matter of trying to figure out how best to manage them and how to get them cited and prove it out from a validation, validation perspective. So each of these are critical as we move forward in trying to figure out our, our energy mix. Um, but they're also important because if you can um, place these on properties that really have no other developable use because they have a cap on them or some other um, way of closure, that also lessens than putting these on virgin greenfield properties that could be utilized in a best use in a different location. The beaver is to think about what the project that Glenn Shaw worked on, which was the beaver mimicry of installing beaver ponds in um, surface water drainages to see if not only can it reduce um, the load, but can it balance out your water, your water balance. I was talking to somebody within the Blackfoot um, tribal community and beaver mimicry and beaver impoundments are one of their foundational elements of their climate adaptation plan. In addition, beavers are sacred to them. So they're not only being able to acknowledge their cultural values, but they're also able to manage climate adaptation by using these natural processes. And then the last picture is around drones. We know that we've got the drone certificate here and many people have been using drones for assessment. Um, it was great to be able to utilize drones up in Alaska as part of the oil spill response, because again, that made for a much greater safety uh, factor associated with these. And the question is, can we also utilize these for some of these um, abandoned mine complexes? Can we actually not only conduct the assessment, but can we conduct the remediation utilizing drones so we're not having to build roads through Forest Service property or BLM or whose ever property it is, and usually they're up on a side embankment. Can we do things differentially so we're not creating those scarred landscapes to get to the scarred landscape that's still left there? So there's some opportunities around that. So fundamentally, you might wonder, this started in 2000, why now? Why does it make sense for it to re-up it now? One of them, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about it, is the infrastructure bill that's currently out, provides an opportunity for a lot of foundational research around uh, both environmental, um, all aspects associated with environmental, the infrastructure, as well as um, energy side of things. Um, as Steve mentioned in his talk, Butte was one of eight cities um, chosen to do some workshops that are coming up in May that I know he's uh, gotten some survey information on, but really looking at that climate adaptation and renewable energy and how to move Butte forward in that space. And so that kicks off. We also know that the vast majority of large companies have 2030 and 2050 targets around carbon emissions, either get to get to half or to net neutral uh, by one of these timeframes. So there is a lot of work that industries are trying to figure out. And the one thing that's really great about um, academia is we're not tied to one particular um, company. We're here to look at everybody across the board 
And instead of having every company have to do their own individual research, there's the opportunity to do it once and to share it globally. That was one of the things that came out of Deepwater Horizon was it was very clear that um, when BP walked away from that, it, well, when they completed it, was to say, if there is something environmental or safety wise, we should be spreading that information to everybody. Because what one company does affects every company and every environment that they work in. Um, you can always have proprietary things around your production elements, but when it comes to environmental and safety side of things, that is not proprietary. We want to look at the good of all. We have a lot of continuing wildfires, um, certainly around here and other locations, they are continuing to grow. And so that's just something that needs to be looked at and seeing how we can reduce those. The amount of carbon that has been coming off there. I was listening to a webinar by Jennifer Wilcox, who I think is Department of Energy, um, Deputy Administrator for um, Carbon Sequestration. And she pointed out two things. One, the amount of, of carbon emission from California during one of their wildfire seasons was more carbon emitted than most of the industry and the rest of the, the country. And so we think about um, trying to control these individual industries. If we don't get control of these wildfires, we are continuing to um, dig ourselves a hole around the carbon budget. The other thing that she mentioned was actually adding tailings to cement. So just a, a side note on that one. And then really solutions to become more scalable and adaptable industry, government, communities, they need to be able to move forward. They need to take action and they're looking for opportunities to take those action. And I think academia and this research center as well as other research centers are a great place to be able to do that. So I've just got a couple of pages around some of the infrastructure investment projects, um, not to dwell on any particular ones of these, but clearly um, the federal government is looking at these whether it's about around abandoned hard rock mine reclamation, around ecosystem uh, restoration, clean energy on formal mine lands, critical minerals, uh, renewable energy projects, all of these are really within Montana Tech's wheelhouse. Carbon storage, carbon utilization, and then really training that next generation of folks for which many of you in either undergraduate or graduate or faculty are always thinking about work, workforce training. Um, these are just some of the projects that have been mentioned um, around the ecosystem. These are um, some of the ones that are ongoing for 2022 uh, that Robert Powell and Glenn Shaw have been working on. A lot of them around that remediation, restoration, uh, collaboration. Waste management, there's um, a couple different ones around whether they're critical minerals or having better understanding with drones um, or looking to work with communities. They all deal with waste management. And then there's the public health and communications that are ongoing around trying to really look at that wildfire uh, indoor air dust, um, smoke, and how can we better manage that as well as community engagement. So those are already current research projects that are ongoing here at Tech. These are just some of the departments. Um, and I'll just say these are individuals that have been meeting with individually to say whether or not our departments, um, I anticipate that there's many more out there. It's just a matter of time and um, ability to get around and talk with people. But, um, what this just accentuates, and I was actually talking with somebody on the IAB today, and they were incredibly pleased, and we heard this also when uh, Newmont recently funded some projects, they love the thought about collaboration cross-departmental work. Because anytime you get in your silo of an individual department, you probably are not doing the best work possible. It really takes that broader brain that Montana Tech has to really do the best work possible. Um, these are some of the current external partners. Um, I know in, in conversations with uh, particularly Pizza Rabo and, and NCAT um, recently, they're both thinking very heavily about where 
the center and those organizations can fit and, and have discussions. Um, so we'll still continue to, to look for those opportunities. So anybody who has a potential research project or thought about a research project would like to hear from. So as I finish up here and hopefully hear from you guys, what kind of research themes might we be missing just because I have tunnel vision or the people that have been working on this have tunnel vision? What other kind of collaborations and partnerships um, do you recommend? And I wanted to highlight and bold this that really it's you all as faculty and students that make this possible. There is no one person that can make a center work. It really takes the collective uh, brain out there to make this happen. And then the last item, we wanted to hold this public lecture before any press release was um, released, because I think there should always be an opportunity for people internal to an organization to have discussion and input prior to going um, very far, far externally, in addition to our partners. Um, so this was an opportunity to hear from individuals to say whether or not there should be any course correction or additions, deletions, whatever it might be, but that provides that opportunity. And that is my summary talk. So I will stop sharing. Oh, there's a chat. Resilient Butte. Oh. Oh, through the end cap? Yes. Thank you, Steve. So I'm opening it up to you all. What do you think? What, what partnerships should we be looking for? What more research themes, less research themes, greater focus, challenges, opportunities? What do you all think? Hello. You can write in the chat or just speak out. Or wait for me to call on you. Worst case. Courtney, your name is up there. It is. <clears throat> We will have many conversations, Robin, over all kinds of things. Uh, as you know, I'm a stalwart for the mining industry. Um, I wanna make sure that we do it right. And that's not always been the case in the past. Uh, and I, you know, the industry doesn't like where it's at right now, but when the government, federal government wanted copper, we got it to them. And if, if we didn't do that, we wouldn't have won the World War I and World War II and things like that. So Butte's yeah. got a lot to be proud of uh, in that regard. Um, and, but I wanna, you know, you mentioned Peru and I, I really feel for these countries that do a lot for the world, but we leave them in a polluted environment. Absolutely. And, you know, the, the trip that you mentioned, I was a big part of a, a large team and we took turns going down there. <clears throat> um, and uh, Chris Gammons and I, uh, we were on different teams, but we probably came away with that, with probably the best information. Uh, and so we, we published that uh, with our Peruvian co-authors. We still have a relationship with Universidad de Altiplano. And I would love, I've been trying to, uh, when I was department head, keep that going, but it was just impossible. But it's not now. I'm not department head anymore. And I really see some value on that. Um, <clears throat> and I'm supposed to meet with these guys later in the summer to start to reinvigorate that. I, my first question to you, are you interested? Sure, actually the first year I was at Mines, did a project with um, 
in Peru for, it was, I think, at University of Lima, maybe. Um, and did you ever see the quimboletes that they use for grinding? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so we, we had a um, group of students that looked at the, their process and how to conduct improvement because they were still using mercury. And I know you saw a lot of mercury use there. Um, when you were there, I saw mercury use in um, Colombia when I was there. And I tell people the story of, I was talking to one of the processing guys who had converted over to cyanide and they have no measurements. They just kind of, you know, add things. And um, I said, so how do you know when you're adding too much or too little? And he said, well, when my kidneys start hurting, I go home and I drink carrot juice for two days and then I go back to work. Yeah. And that's, that's, you know, life as of last year. So it's a very different context that we're talking about. Well, and it's, it's not just Peru, it's all over the world, but I, I felt we were making a good impact there and uh, the Peruvian government changed uh, governments essentially um, and that work came to a halt and there's still a lot of interest in reinvigorating that. So yeah. it's one of those things that I really want to pursue before I, I eventually retire. Um, and as long as you're interested, I think we could, we should do that. So yeah, um, some really good people there. Yes. So I'm going to turn it over to others. Okay. I got the ball rolling on your question. Thank you, Courtney. Is Todd still on there? Oh, yeah. Hi, Todd. For me, I, my video is, is not working, but. Uh, well, well, you I, got a picture. That helps. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's my farming days, you know. Hey, farming's just, great roots. Uh, I, I don't have a lot to add. I, I started to type something in the chat, but basically it was just like, I like what you're doing. I'm really excited about it. Um, I don't have anything to add or change at the moment. Um, okay. I don't know. Well, I think just keeping, you know, that those open communications between departments and, you know, I, I think there's a lot of things that are possible. Um, it's just trying to figure out how to get them all done. Yeah, like prioritizing the ones you want to prioritize. And, but, you know, we got good leadership in place. That's the most important part. So I think from then on. <laughs> it's a collective leadership. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to pick on Janelle. Cause, are you still there, Janelle? Yeah. So you're a grad student, but you're also a working grad student. How would um, something like this center work into wanting you to do more graduate work or um, being able to work on certain elements of it? What, what do you like and what do you wish wasn't there or was there? Oh boy. Um... <laughs> Well, I don't know how to answer that, to be honest. So uh, there was a lot of information. I think it'd be a great um, resource for um, especially two projects that I'm currently working on. Um, just having more information available to understand what's going on with some of these sites that I'm working with and knowing how to remediate them a little bit more efficiently so yeah if that if that answers your question <laughs> that's perfect I appreciate it Janelle is one of the ones that might be interested in the stackable certificates because she's working 80 hours a week anyway so why not add more to her plate <laughs> um, but she's a very committed individual doing great work um, around restoration and remediation um, well, I won't pick on any, any other folks. Um, if you have any questions, I'm always open to a conversation, uh, whether it's me or anybody else associated with this uh, particular center. 
The information is on the website. We're continuing to try to build it up and explore it because I really do think there's some incredible work that's being done here at Tech and it's just getting it out to um, current students, future potential students, as well as partners, and then um, really seeing the value of being implemented in the field, I think is important as well. Any other outstanding things that either of you guys can think of? Okay, thank you all. I appreciate your time. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, bye.